What's going on, Fud Nation, and welcome back. Today, we are talking with none other than the man himself, Mr. 100X, Ian Bellina. Now, we know Ian Bellina has a very polarizing reputation here in crypto land, but I encourage you to hear the man out. He's got a very interesting history that's led him up to this point, and he's working on a pretty cool project. I'm gonna let him do all of the explaining, but I encourage you to have an open mind as there are a ton of gems within it. And of course, if you're looking for a new new, potentially very exciting and profitable investment, not financial advice. We do talk about several of those within this interview. So I encourage you definitely sit tight, check it out and let me know what you think about Ian Bellina, this whole interview, the projects that we discuss and more in the comment section below. Do me a favor and hit that like button. It's a free and easy way to support the channel. So without further ado, let's get into this interview with Ian Bellina. Welcome to FUD TV, Ian Bellina. How are you doing? I'm great. How about you? I'm doing great. It's absolutely a pleasure to have you here on the show. I know we've been talking on and off uh, in different sort of capacities for several months now. So it's great to finally have you here on the show. It's an honor. I mean, I've been following the channel for some time. You definitely do a great job with the content. So it's a pleasure to be on. Thanks, man. Well, you know, you've been here in this industry for quite a while. You've made a really big splash uh, with your name. I think there's probably very few people in this industry, definitely in the YouTube side of things, that don't know you. Um, how'd you get started here in crypto land? Like, what was your first entry point? And then I want to sort of go through this journey that has been Ian Bellina up till now. Yeah, so I joined crypto in the fall of 2016. I was working at, at IBM. A friend of mine from my DC college days said, hey, Ian, can you put me in touch with the director of blockchain at IBM? And I said, why do you want to talk to this guy? Then he told me he was a Bitcoin developer. He was launching his own crypto fund. Mm -hmm. And I said, you're launching a crypto fund? I was like, you've never worked on Wall Street. You're doing Bitcoin and you're launching a crypto fund. So I, that just kind of piqued my, my interest. So I began grilling him kind of going deep into things because that's really my personality. I like, when I find something, I like to drill down mm -hmm. and really see if there's anything worthwhile in it. So, and I'm pretty direct. So I was like, how much money are you making? Just be honest with me. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me who was making 200% just out of Bitcoin and Ethereum. And, and me as somebody who was actively investing in, in the markets, and I did have a high appetite for risk. I had dabbled in penny stocks. I had lost a bunch of money three or four years back investing in penny stocks for cannabis at the time. <laughs> you, you, you were a couple years early. Yeah. So after that, I was like, you know what? What do I have to lose? So that same week I joined Coinbase, put in 200 bucks on my account, got 100 bucks worth of Bitcoin and 100 bucks worth of Ethereum. Had no idea what Ethereum was. It was just the mm -hmm. second I see there. So I said, why not? And what, 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 date, what date was this? Like what, what time period? This was around October 2016, so I believe. What a wonderful time. Yeah, I would say October, maybe September 2016. Ethereum was at $9. Bitcoin was at, I think, 740 or 850. Somewhere it was kind of bouncing between that range. And I said, okay, you know what? Now I own some Bitcoin and some Ethereum. I have to learn more about this. So the first mm -hmm. thing I do every time I kind of delve into a new industry, I find the best books in that space. So I hop on Amazon. The best books at that time were Digital Gold and the Age of Cryptocurrency. Got those two books over the course of two or three months, went through those books. And I was like, you know what? I'm all in. Now I'm, mm -hmm. a, I'm a believer. So mm -hmm. fast forward to January 2017, that, that same year, I earned my commission check from, from IBM. I was working in, in enterprise sales. So I joined IBM my first three years as a technical sales engineer. My background is, is as a computer engineer, but I, but I ended up changing over to becoming a sales executive at IBM, covering the IBM analytics brand. So I was doing that. And each year after each quarter, they basically pay you commissions. So my first big check, I purchased some crypto. So I put in about 2,500 into crypto. So going from 200, 200 bucks to 2,500 was a big leap. Almost so ten, you 10 X. Yeah, 10 X. So I was like, you know what? I'm all in. Then that same week, 
or like a week later, Ethereum announced the Ethereum Enterprise Alliance. They had Microsoft and all these other big names, JP Morgan involved. Ethereum's price went to like 25 bucks, then eventually to like 40 bucks. And I'm sitting there like, I just doubled or just tripled my money in a few weeks. I was like, guys, sell everything. We're going all in. And that's really when I went all in, in, into crypto. I began living and breathing crypto 24-7. So I'd work my day job nine to five, then six to midnight, I was on crypto. I was in telegram groups, trading, doing everything. Because my goal was to quit my job at IBM and to quit that nine to five and the rat, rat race by the end of the year. So I gave myself an ultimatum. So there was this famous uh, captain who went down to South America and said, burn the ships. They burned the ships and they said, either we conquer or we die. So that's really the same mindset I had in 2017. I said, either I'm going to make enough money to live on my own and quit my job or I quit. But regardless of, what, of whatever happens, I was going to quit my job at IBM by the end of the year. So that really made me get the dedication to go all in and just study this 24-7. And by the end of the year, was that the end of the year 2016 or 17? 2017. 2017. Okay. So when did you start? Because obviously, m many people know you through your content. So when did you start creating content? When did you realize that content was uh, a, a, an important avenue in crypto? So I began making content that same month, January 2017. Now, initially, it wasn't for crypto. So I was doing lots of other things. Uh, so I had a Amazon FBA business, so I was making content on that. I had a short-term real estate business, so I was basically doing rentals on Airbnb. Mm -hmm. So I was doing content around that. Then when, I, when my crypto investments at that time, Bitcoin and Ethereum kind of began pumping, I made a video on it basically Bitcoin and crypto for beginners. That ended up being the best content I made. My audience said, you know what? Do more content on this. So a, a month or two later, I went to my first crypto conference. It was, the, it was called Token Summit in New York. This was around May 2017. I went there and I was just blown away. My first time meeting real people in crypto in person and they all looked very nice. They were professionals. They weren't crazy. They weren't people from Silk Road or the dark web or like mm -hmm. people just kind of looked look like bad characters. Cause that was my earlier assumption of some, of some people in the, in the crypto space. Cause it was very anonymous, very private, but I met people like Vinny Lingam. So mm -hmm. at that conference, they had companies pitching that Tezos pitch. They had civic pitch. They had mm -hmm. X pitch like these products ended up becoming very, very popular. And I met all those guys there. And I also met my first crypto millionaires. And I, I talked to them, had drinks with them, took them out to dinner, and this really picked their minds. And I noticed a pattern. All the crypto millionaires I met made their money early on, not from day trading, but from in get, getting in on the Ethereum ICO, getting in on the MageSafe ICO. And I began asking them, what the hell is an ICO? So after that conference, conference, I said, you know what? If I follow the money, and since the money, all the people making money are, in, are investing in ICOs, they're getting in early, they're getting in at the ground floor. So over the course of a month or so, I began investing in my first ICOs. So my first ICO was, I think, some mobile gaming company. Uh, I think MGO might, might have been that token. And then some, some other companies. Basically, I was investing in any ICO that, that, that could walk. <laughs> and I made some decent money, but nothing to really make, make you want to, re to retire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know what? It would be a better way. Yeah, I so, forgot. I, I always forget to check, check the, uh, the category of if this ICO can walk before investing. That's definitely, <laughs> it's definitely critical. So I appreciate right? that. So, yeah. I mean, so when other investors kind of go through that phase, I definitely empathize. Empath Ties with them because I've been there too. We're mm -hmm. just concerned about making the money. It was really just gambling. I was just throwing money at anything because yep. I thought this could pump. But after a while, I realized that wasn't really a, the way to go long term. So me being a well, data guy. Well, you had, you had quite a bit of success in the ICO market, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm kind of going to that. So 
me being a data guy, so at IBM, my job was, was to work, work with data and analytics. So I would sell to large companies like Macy's, Staples, uh, EY. And I said, because that same year, I had been featured in the Wall Street Journal's newsletter to investors about how I used IBM Analytics and Watson to predict my March Madness bracket. So I said, you know what? Maybe we can apply this Moneyball approach to investing to, to ICOs. So over the course of a week or so, I just gathered as much data as I could on, on ICOs, which ones were doing well, different data points, quantitative and qualitative data points. And I tried to find patterns in the data. And the patterns I found were the products that typically did well. The biggest factor at that time was the team, them having a product, which now kind of seems common sense. But back then, most ICOs were, were raising money with no product. Uh, the, the advisors, how, the hard cap, all these different factors. And I, made every, I put everything into a spreadsheet. Then one time I was just really, once I began doing more content on crypto, over the course of a live stream, I shared my spreadsheet and my audience was like, whoa, what is that? Hmm. So they, they all asked me for it. And I said, sure, why not? So I made my spreadsheet open source and I shared it with my audience on my site. And that's when things kind of began to take off because I ended up publishing my first, kind of like my top picks of my highest rated ICOs of the month. This was August, 2017. Mm -hmm. that, those ICOs were Zero X protocol and, and District Zero X. When they came out, they, they did amazingly well. Zero X did a 10 X within one month. Uh, DNT did a 24 X. And that's when kind of the word of mouth began spreading about the spreadsheet and me and who I was. And every single month, we basically had high rated projects. We began doing live streams that would go two to, to four hours sometimes of just researching live on the air projects that people would bring to us, my audience. And that's, this was at a time when, uh, at least on crypto YouTube, most people were still anonymous. So here I was, this guy, not hiding, telling everyone, everyone everything about me, my real name, where I worked. They could call up my company and I'd be like, this guy is a scammer or whatever. I, I was very, very authentic. So plus making my investment spreadsheet publicly available to anybody, even beginners and newbies, really kind of added so much value to And when the spreadsheet began to work and I was making money, because while all this was happening, I was publicly sharing my portfolio, all my investments, the exact investment amount, how much I made, how much I lost, every single day. I would post my blog portfolio on, on, on my Twitter, on my Instagram, every single day. So people who followed me began to kind of like follow me every single day just to kind of see how my portfolio was doing. So over the course of the next four months, people saw me build my portfolio. So over the course of the first few months, I put in, I was basically dollar cost averaging every single month. So in total, I put in about 90 grand into crypto. And in less than one year, I turned that into, at the peak, about four and a half million dollars or five million dollars. So, so, so you did it exceptionally well. And uh, obviously, how much do you think of those gains were attributed to amazing data analytics? And how much of those gains were exceptional timing? Um, you know, because uh, the best data analytics right now isn't getting you a 10 X. Yes. Yeah. Good question. So I think at the time, timing definitely was a factor. So the way the market was, obviously things have changed. Um, so I would say it was probably both right. Timing definitely mattered. I, I definitely don't, don't want to understate that. I think probably half of it was due, due to timing, just being in the right place at the right time. But that's really the, the that's the, that's how you, you define getting lucky, right? Just being in the right place at the right time and just taking advantage of an opportunity. Mm -hmm. But also the level of research we did because some projects we found like Wabi, my most profitable investment, did a 140X or something like that. Wow. It was an unknown project in China, India. And really we were literally the, the first investors in. We got in at three cents during the, the private sale and at that point, I thought it was a scam because <laughs> I, was, I was trying to send them money. So, so how, how, much did you, how much were you trying to send them while you thought they were a scam? So I, was, I, was, I sent them 
two thousand dollars. I think okay, yeah, I think two grand. And the first two or three days, the web- website was crashing, and and half the site was in Chinese. <laughs> and I was like, Ian, you're this is a highly rated project, but the website is down for like two or three days. Half of half of the site is in Chinese. You can barely read it. What if this is a scam? What if you and the whole world sees you send money to the scam and get scammed? I was like, you know what? Either I believe in my research or I don't. So I have, I have to put my money where my mouth is. So I did. And then the rest is kind of history. And December is really the month I blew up in the crypto space mm-hmm. because I had two 100x investments that same month. Wabi and Icon began trading. Both did 100x. Then Dragon Chain did an ADX. So we had three investments in one month do an ADX return. And even though the market was doing well for, for, for Bitcoin, we up, up from that by a mile. And that's when everybody kind of began telling the, the, the crypto friends about me. I, I went viral. My, my YouTube went to over 100,000 subscribers. And we really couldn't keep the, the, phone, the phones from ringing. So you really, you know, you built your brand around finding these uh, previously unknown coins, right? That's probably the, that's the core of your appeal at the core of your brand, the core of your gains uh, were understanding new projects. And I feel like that desire to research new projects and present them to a broader audience is really kind of what inspired this explosion of crypto social media as well, because Bitcoin's amazing and talking about Bitcoin is useful and, and fun and great. However, interpreting white papers about technical sort of new products coming out, that actually really creates a, an amazing use case for the crypto content creator as well, because it gives you a lot, uh, a lot more levels to go down and do research. Do you feel like uh, that kind of research is as useful and as relevant today? Yes, yeah. So I, I think it's definitely still relevant. That's why I'm, I'm now kind of working on, on my project token metrics. but it's evolved, it's changed. So what was working successfully in 2017 no longer works. So it's kind of like a cat and mouse game. So for example, in 2018, although we were still doing well, the amount of money we're making in our investments decreased because the market as a whole was bearish. Even though we still had a profitable year, projects began to target me and really game my system. So people know I've had issues with Sparkstar. That's kind of one of the projects that really tarnished my, Im- my image because they basically so they had to just check all these boxes and they could just lie, lie to us and basically just kind of make promises that they knew they couldn't fulfill just to check these boxes to raise money. Mm. And that's what really... Give me an example of, of what boxes they tried to check uh, and, and how this... How this, how this targeted you? Yeah, so for example, claiming they have an all-star team, claiming they have X, X, Y, and Z partnerships, claiming they're going to, to do this, right? Claiming they're going to launch at this particular date, then taking, uh, claiming they'll launch in two weeks, then taking 12 months or lo- longer to launch, right? So all these different things. Back Because back then, don't forget, the level of due diligence in crypto wasn't as strong as it is, as it is now. Oh, I, I, I remember. I remember. <laughs> it was, it was. Hey, they have a, hey, they have a photo of their face. They're, they're being transparent and authentic. Uh, they interned at Google, so they're, they're geniuses. You know, uh, I think that when we look back, that will be certainly one of the hallmarks of of that era, which was, you know, the whole market was behaving so illogically that it made sense. It made sense to be throwing thousands of dollars at things that you had no way to verify were scams because most of the time it made you a lot of money. And so it it was sort of like the dot-com era where investing in something just because they added dot-com to their name made sense because most of the people that did that tripled, quadrupled their their, uh, stock market value. So um, it it, it was an illogical time. what do you think, uh, we can circle back to, see, to talk about some of the, the more negative experiences you had there, but what do you think are the biggest differences between 2020 and really 2017, 18? Um, like you said, that December of 2017, that January of 2018, that was the peak, right? That was the pinnacle. We've never seen <laughs> explosive gains like that. 
Um, and, and was that in any way, in your opinion, authentic behavior? Or was that the big whales sort of seeing that the, the trend had boiled over and just kind of getting, getting their big sort of payoff out of it before, before going back into hibernation? Uh, good question. So I definitely don't think it was anything sustainable. I mean, obviously now kind of going back and seeing everything, there was no way the 100Xs could be sustained. Because I recall I was at my barber shop and they're talking about crypto. Yeah. <laughs> and that's usually the time, you, the, the, the best time to sell. So, because I mean, in any industry, you kind of have these crazy run-ups where everybody's making money, but then eventually the market matures and the gains subside and it gets tougher and tougher to make money because I feel like in, in investing, you always have to be 10 steps ahead to make money. Yep. And when ICOs blew up in 2017, 2018, everybody kind of learned the ropes. Everybody knew how to make money with ICOs. So it became even tougher and tougher to invest. Then you had regulation come in that really kind of slowed down everything and made it tougher and tougher for projects to, to raise money. So in terms of the average investor investing in crypto at that time, that was definitely not something that could be sustained. And I think for me, the lessons learned were, I mean, sometimes greed is, well, basically greed is not good. And even though you're making a killing investing in something, you should always try to be rational and remove the emotions from it and say, am I making this based on skill or just based on luck or just being at the right place at the right time? Because people were, make, as you said, were making 5X, 10X, 20Xs very easily. And they thought everything could continue. Because I know people who were making, looking back, even back then, I think very illogical investments, like going putting half of their portfolio in one particular altcoin because it's going up. Because even now, I mean, anything besides maybe Bitcoin or fiat, I don't think, because even back then, I never really re recommended anybody to invest more than 10% of their assets into one particular coin. Because just because something has good technology, something else could happen. Whether it's a BitConnect, whether it's due to regulation or to somebody dying or, or what have you, there's so many other risks besides just that investment risk that now looking back as I've kind of become a more mature investor, I understand, right? That's why last year I really kind of saw ways for me to really learn from my lessons. So I, I took about three months to practice and take the series 65 investment advisor exam. And I ended up passing that because I saw what the space is going. The space is getting more mature. Regulation is coming in. And I knew if I want to kind of be in the space long term, I have to really kind of learn the ropes and really also know how to protect investors as somebody who's creating content. Because mm -hmm. people know, know me as somebody who creates content around ICOs. And uh, no, no, no matter how many times I tried to warn people or protect people, there are some people who don't listen. You, you tell them not to go all in, they go all in. And I, now I, I understand that even though they may not listen, the onus is still on me to try to protect them as much as possible. So that's why really just getting education from regular investment advisors and seeing how they do it, I think is really the, the way for me to improve long term. What's your biggest regret? What's your biggest mistake you think you made? And what's your biggest regret from that era of uh, when things were going crazy and uh, you potentially um, achieved a polarizing image in the, in the crypto landscape? What, what would you look back and change? Wow. Um, I think if I could look back and change, uh, I think I probably would have handled Sparkster differently because... When I invested, I, I, I would say two things. So when I invested in Sparkster, you, you only had about a week or so to do research on it. So doing that while we were traveling and doing a crypto world tour was tough. Mm -hmm. And then we expected the project to list within two weeks. So it was really a quick flip in a way, right? Because we're saying, okay, this project is, is going to list in, in two weeks. It's pretty popular. There, there isn't really much risk involved, even if it's, it may not end up 
being that good of a project as expected, we can at least maybe take out our initial in less than a month. But when it took 12 months to list, that's when it really dawned on us. Okay, you know what? We think we messed up. But where we messed up was we thought short-term as opposed to long-term because there are people who blindly follow us and what we choose to invest in. Even though we may warn them and tell them, hey, don't invest just because we're investing, do your own research, whatever. Because I've met people who said that they basically, basically they spent their grocery money or their mortgage money and went all into a particular investment with a spark store or some other project, despite our warnings not to go all in. And now kind of thinking about that, we realize, you know what, we, we always have to have a very long-term perspective. So thinking like several years down the road, will this project still be there? So now kind of taking that long-term perspective when it comes to our investment, investment research, uh, looking back, that's one thing I think I definitely messed up on when it comes to Sparkston. I think I definitely regret if I can change anything. It's kind of not thinking about this as being a quick flip just because it's launching on an exchange in a week or two and still having the perspective, yes, but what about two years from now? Well, I appreciate you sharing that. And, you know, I, I know I've been following your journey. I know that you have uh, definitely stayed uh, focused on the long term, especially more and more recently with your new project. Um, how, how much does that new mindset with 2020, uh, a whole new crypto landscape, how much does that long-term mindset inform your decisions? Uh, do you even believe there are such things as short-term gains in crypto anymore? Uh, short-term? I mean, unless you're a trader, yes, but, long, but I think the money is, is long-term. That, that's, kind of that's something that's really been proven already to, to the regular investment, investing world. The money is in long-term gains, buy and hold. But you do have to kind of manage your portfolio. So we, we call this active portfolio man management. So this doesn't mean you day trade. It just means you make a few trades or a few investments every single year. So as opposed to holding Bitcoin from 20000 down to 3000 maybe you get out at 16000 and get back in at 5000 Yes, it's not perfectly timing the, the top and the bottom, but it still saves you money. Or mm -hmm. maybe it's when something is, you think is at the bottom, getting in and then holding up all the way. So that's really the, the approach we have now is taking that active portfolio management perspective. And I, for me, the, the main le lesson I learned is whatever weaknesses and lessons we've had, we've tried to build upon them. Mm -hmm. So yes, I lost a bunch of money on Sparkster uh, and, and also other projects. But I understand that, you know what, the only way to get better is to keep on improving. That's why we've built up our team. We now have, we, we had a blockchain developer from Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan, who's worked on the blockchain products to come in and help us with doing due diligence and projects. We've had a trader from Goldman Sachs who comes in and helps us with technical analysis. So building a team together, bringing on machine learning engineers to help us with quantitative modeling and price predictions. So now kind of putting in other people around us, I think is really our, our focus and our perspective for, for long-term growth, because we understand that the game has changed. Now institutions are coming in. So the average crypto investor at home is competing against these this whales. So how do you compete? You either have to get smarter or you have to figure out how to have the same tools and technology and platforms they have. So I, so I appreciate what you're saying there, and, and it sounds like you're really trying to create a platform that serves a retail investor and almost harkens back to that golden era of 2017 of how can we really uh, find a new asset, learn about it, invest early, and profit from it. However, the market has kind of shown that that model is, is not really working. Um, and I guess the question is that a lot of people have right now is, are even the best altcoins going to be able to experience a, a similar uh, growth cycle like we saw before? And is that even something that should happen, right, for these small projects that you should have these 100Xs? Or is that really uh, unsustainable and potentially overall even negative for the market? Uh, good question. I mean, long term, we still believe so. But we think the 100Xs are not there anymore. As opposed to happening in a, a few months, we think they'll happen over several years. So maybe as opposed to happening in four months, it will happen in four years. So kind of having that long-term perspective. But those projects are still there. 
Mm-hmm. So one of the best performing projects of last year was Matic Network. Mm-hmm. So despite all the, I guess, the criticisms we get, that was a project we were very early on. We met that team during our world travels in India. They were mm-hmm. winners of our Hyderabad Crypto World Tour. And this was before, this was one year before Binance. So we still think investors can find those good projects. So in 2018, we, we had a chance to meet Matic Network, Elrond, and Harmony, all the best performing IEOs on Binance, almost one year before their IEOs. Mm-hmm. And we knew they were good back then. So we think if people put in the work, they can still find these good projects. It, it just takes more time. And you really have to be doing this full time to, to find those products early on. And you have to be willing to take a, a, a long-term bet because unlike 2017, where you find a good project and it begins trading in one year, I mean, uh, in, in one month, we're finding, now you have to find those good projects and expect them not to really go public or be tradable anywhere until one year later on. Yep. So that requires a huge level of patience and also belief because mm-hmm. You have to ask yourself, am I willing to put my money in this project and wait one or two years? So you, you really have to think like a traditional equity investor. And that's really the mindset now I think crypto is becoming. Well, I appreciate you sharing that and I agree completely. Uh, I think that people rushing to list tokens uh, is, is bad for token holders, right? It's bad because when you don't have utility and you don't have a reason to buy it, you only have a reason to speculate uh, what happens is you mostly have a reason to sell it. And, and so it, it's just a, becomes a one-sided market until the actual uh, project is really ready and has that momentum. And once it has that momentum, then there can be a two-sided market and then it can be uh, very successful. So I agree with you. And a lot of people just uh, came into this industry. They don't understand tech startups. You come from IBM. You understand what a tech development cycle looks like, what the actual, uh, you know, quarterly milestones for a successful tech company look like, what the organizational structure for these projects in, in, in its ideal form look like. And there's never a hundred X on the board. Like that's never a, a realistic target for even the best company. So uh, I think what you're saying is, is absolutely right. So now to put a pin in this, how are you investing in 2020? What, what are the opportunities we're looking at and, and what should the audience be looking forward to? Good question. So right now, we're, we're taking the same approach of leveraging data and analytics and also human capital, but we've built a platform token metrics where now we're also adding machine learning to our investing because this is the future of investing. Um, if you go on Wall Street, the best performing hedge fund of all time, the Medallion Fund by Jim Simons is a quant fund. Uh, mm-hmm. Based on PwC in 2018, the best performing crypto funds were quant funds. Mm-hmm. They made money in a bear market. They had eight mm-hmm. percent profit in 2018, in a year when Bitcoin was down 72 mm-hmm. percent. So now the question is, how does the average investor compete with quant funds? So in tradition, when you look at the stock market, the only way they're really competing is now with robo advisors. So we believe this is the future of investing, where a robo advisor can manage and balance it, an investor's portfolio. But this hasn't really been done in, in crypto. Yes, you have trading bots, but I have, I know so many investors who've gotten scammed with trading bots. Mm-hmm. So with us, we're in the process of working towards becoming an SEC licensed investment advisor so that we can then build a robo advisor for crypto. But in the meantime, the first way to look at the first step or the first process prior to that is building the platform. So building what we call kind of th- think of this as the morning star for crypto. It's mm-hmm. an analytics platform that has data on over 100 different cryptocurrencies, we look at over 74 different data points. We, we, go, we have teams that go through and manually score the fundamentals, manually, manually do code reviews and, and analysis. We have automated technical analysis. And then scoring in real time, not just ICOs, kind of like, like a, with my past spreadsheet, but now also tokens trading on exchanges. So from Bitcoin, think top 20 market cap, top 100 market cap, and then being able to tell you based on the data and, and the machine learning and, and AI, what's the better investment? Whether it's up and coming non-listed project, so for example, the next Matic network, or Bitcoin or Ethereum or Tron or 
Tezos at this particular mm -hmm. point in time, looking at the fundamentals, the technology, and the uh, and the predictions and the AI. So, to make things simple for investors, we're creating kind of like an index fund. So we call this the the token metrics index, where we have the top ten rated cryptocurrencies in real time based on all those data points. So investors can log in on our website, tokenmetrics.com, and just access every single day the highest rated products. So for example, we had Dash. Dash was third or fourth on our index. And that's done a, a 2x in, in the last week or so. Mm -hmm. So, so far, it's, it's been performing well. And that's how I'll be personally investing. Uh, and, and then that, that's how really our entire team is investing. Because for us, this is really a platform we're building for ourselves to invest. And just like we did with the ICS spreadsheet, we're making this available to the entire crypto community as a whole. So, I mean, first of all, I'm very intrigued, right? I'm very intrigued because that's one of the things that I find most exciting about the space is the new projects. I also find them to be, to be exceptionally risky. And as my own channel got bigger, I found that I was less and less inclined to share about these new projects because I get really enthusiastic and I get excited um, and then immediately in the comments, I see just bought, just bought, just bought, just bought. And it's like, well, guys, I didn't say it. <laughs> I was just saying I'm excited, but yeah, I get it. Like you want to buy. And so I, I started to feel, um, you know, that I couldn't, you know, given the market conditions, it, I felt like I was not comfortable just sharing all the coins that I thought were, were cool. Uh, it's, it wasn't 2017 anymore. It wasn't the early 2018 days. Um, so I guess like, wh what do you think uh, if you were going to, put some generic sort of categories on it. What do you think are going to be some of the great projects this year? And then also, what is the pricing model for using token metrics? Yeah, so the good projects, in our opinion, as usual, this is not financial investment advice. Uh, this is just our personal opinion, but based on the research, so projects that are not listed anywhere that we like up and coming. So Helium Network, they're building a wireless, uh, kind of like a wireless internet. So mm -hmm. they have a wireless hotspot that I've been mining on that for about a month or so. And it lets IoT devices share your Wi-Fi connection and in, in exchange you earn tokens. They're backed by Google Ventures and some other big names, Coastal Ventures. Uh, so I think that's definitely one to put on your watch list. N not to invest, but to just kind of put on your watch list when it eventually mm -hmm. comes out. Um, Sovereign. Sovereign is one to watch out for. They had an equity round couple of years back. They're mm -hmm. back. They have partnerships with IBM, with Cisco, mm -hmm. uh, US government. Definitely want to keep an eye on. They're building an identity blockchain. So basically being able to, to kind of store everything when it comes to identity on a blockchain. And then products trading. So products that we still think are undervalued. Matic Network. Uh, that's kind of like our, our darling. Being, having a chance to meet the team all the way back in India. Uh, that's that one has done very very well, but we still think it's undervalued. So on the on our token metrics index, it's been hovering between three and four this week because the TA turned bullish. Uh, but its market cap rank is eighty nine. Mm -hmm. So I think this has a chance to eventually be a top twenty coin based on market cap. But talk to, talk to me a little bit about the tokenomics behind Matic Network, because when I see scaling solutions and second layer solutions, I could see them becoming extremely popular. But why would a second layer scaling solution remain popular if the token gets too expensive? It seems like it, it almost gets kind of counterintuitive, right? Where why would we want that for this thing that's supposed to alleviate congestion on Ethereum to all of a sudden become expensive or hard to potentially access uh, due to price. So I guess that's partly what, you know, me as a product guy, I always try to say, put my, my, myself in the, the shoes of the end user. And while I understand that projects are exciting, uh, Matic's not going up in price because it's being used so much. It's going up in price because of hype, because of news, because mm -hmm. of rumors. Is, is there really a, an end scenario where so many people are using Matic that the, that the token just moons, or is it still a hype cycle? Uh, I mean, it's definitely tough to, to say in terms of how it's going to play out in the future, but we love the technology. We think the te technology, out of all the projects out there, Matic, in our opinion, has the third best technology behind Bitcoin and, and uh, Ethereum. Interesting. So Big words. The third best technology in the entire space. I like that. I like that. Very bold. Uh, even so, even with that technology, does that 
directly translate to a high price. Because I think the same thing about Ethereum, right? I think the same thing about Ethereum is, should Ethereum be so expensive, even if it's the number one smart contracts platform? Because to me, if it's too expensive and it's too congested or, or it becomes too precious, then uh, a competitor will, will launch, uh, become cheaper, faster, better, and, and serve that market. Um, I mean, so it's definitely a good question to kind of ponder. Um, we think long term that they could possibly figure out a, a workaround or a, a solution. Uh, so for us, when we look at a project, we look at several data points, right? So not just one mm -hmm. particular data point. We're looking at over 74 different data points, and each one is weighted differently. Mm -hmm. So despite kind of having those possible challenges in the future, we still think it's a good project. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's definitely something our, our team would, would probably have to look into some more, right? Because we do understand lots of people when it comes to their investment philosophy, look a lot at the possible use case and whether or not something can become too expensive. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I really appreciate all you, all you, all that you've shared today. And I really appreciate your data driven approach. I do want to circle back, uh, talk a little bit about uh, how someone like a retail investor would get their hands on token metrics. How do they access it? What features are, are if there's any free ones or premium features? So, we did have a free promotion for, for the last month or so that unfortunately just wrapped up. However, we do have free trials available uh, for, for two weeks. So we have different tier plans from basic, which basically gives you our top 20 rankings and also Bitcoin information. So Bitcoin code review, 30 day price predictions, mm -hmm. which, which so far have had, an, have had an accuracy of about 95%. So they've been pretty accurate. Uh, but then obviously crypto is very volatile. So with the, with the re recent pumps, we kind of have to fine tune them. Uh, but we're, we run about 200,000 different machine learning models per cryptocurrency every single day. Amazing. So in total, we're running over 20 million models a day, optimizing and testing our grades, trying to find even better grades. So we aren't just kind of saying, this is our grading system. Everything is being tested and the machine learning model says, okay, can we come up with a better weights for our, for our grading system? And every single day we test this. So, I mean, our server costs are growing, are growing exponentially <laughs> as a result, <laughs> but we're doing all this in efforts to give our customers the, 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 best, the, the best way to find profitable investments and filter out the scams. Yep. So that's the basic plan. We have the investor plan and the hardware plan. The hardware plan is more for the top 20 market cap coins. The investor plan is top 100. Then the professional plan is for professional investors. So people for, who are planning to launch crypto funds or who have funds or even just angel investors. And that gives them access to projects outside the top 100 market cap. So there's, there's mm -hmm. hidden gems, those projects that have a lot more risk, but the re reward could be much higher. And, and do, you, do you automate trading or is it, is it just on the, is the, does the user still have to go execute trades? So right now we, right now we, we can't do any trading on the platform. Uh, mm -hmm until we've been licensed by the SEC. Gotcha, so, gotcha. And right, right, right now, it's really just a research platform. Uh, yeah. so, but what people do have is access to technical analysis that's automated, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's based on a weekly time frame, uh, the, the code reviews, then also the price predictions as well. I'd be interested to see how your, your TA, uh, I'd, I'd be interested to hear some, uh, some critiques from other experts in the field and see, because I think this is a model that makes sense, right? It's, it's, it becomes, a destination where you're blending the fundamentals, the technicals, uh, other types of, of data that people probably aren't even readily aware of. And, uh, and hopefully the result is that you can give people a good sense of which projects are strong, which projects have potential. I mean, that's really, uh, to me, uh, what's so, what felt so magical and exciting about 2017 was the feeling of a global stock market, the feeling of a global uh, trade market where the, the best new projects were now available to everybody. Um, so hopefully you can be part of bringing that energy back uh, as, as we rebuild this crypto ecosystem. Yeah. And, and if your audience has any interest in joining, in, uh, jo joining the platform, feel free to use the code FUDTV, one word, all caps. Uh, and that will give you 10% off on the platform. And yeah, enjoy. Uh, we always listen to our customers. So this is really a customer-driven platform. So our goal is really to really make sure the customer journey, because as mentioned earlier, we think for crypto to re really evolve long-term, we have to really be able to onboard new users onto 
crypto investing and research mm -hmm. because gone are the days where people can just blindly invest in anything but we we'll still need to be people to do research but we also realize that not everybody has time to do their research so think of us as kind of like the cliff notes version where we, we, we always tell you every single week what products to put on your watch list and then down the line once we get licensed by the sec being able to also manage and trade your portfolio for you and rebalance your portfolio for you so that's kind of where we're going because we think this is the future of investing not everybody wants to be an active trader or investor some people want to just passively invest and mm -hmm. really take time back because not everybody has time to invest in crypto because it's very emotional <laughs> <laughs> tell me about it tell me about it i'm only 14 and look at me um but yeah uh so you know it all sounds really interesting i'm i really appreciate you sharing it i i didn't know much about the platform actually before uh before today so i really appreciate you sharing it. i think this could serve as something extremely useful uh especially as the market hopefully makes another turn um, so I guess just to close this out, what do you think the Bitcoin price is going to be at the end of 2020? And what are your last sort of final closing words for, you know, the retail investors out there, the people out there who have been in the space since 2017, the people who might be holding a lot of altcoins? What, what are your words of advice and, and where do you think Bitcoin's going to be at the end of the year? Oh, wow. Um, Bitcoin at the end of the year. This is not based on any substantive analysis, just me kind of saying this on the spot. Right now, it's been a, around 8,000. I mean, we have the halving coming. We have institutions coming, Facebook, Libra. I would say $32,000. 32K. I like that. I like that. Bullish yet reasonable. Bullish yeah. yet reasonable. I like yeah. it. I like it. Then the other question was, was that, what was the other question you said? Final words of advice here. A lot of the audience is, uh, are retail investors. A lot of people are uh, very interested in altcoins. People have been holding alt since 2017. A lot of people also love BTC. But a, a lot of people came into this movement uh, with that magical moment that brought you in, the ICO mania and, and the sort of explosion of, of altcoins. I've got, it. I've got it. So this is actually a quote from Warren Buffett, who's mm -hmm. one of the best investors of all time. He says... You don't want to invest in something when it's popular. Mm -hmm. You want to invest in it when nobody wants to touch it, when it's not mm -hmm. popular. And mm -hmm. I feel like if anybody has been around for the last year or two, after the, the Bitcoin ICO mania and FOMO, and you're still around, you should definitely give yourself a pat on the back because now was the time to really educate yourself and learn about this space because when it, when it eventually gets popular, because looking at all the different experts out there, the World Economic Forum, the WEF says, crypto-based assets will have 10% of the world's GDP in 10 years. Mm -hmm. well, wow. if, if we take that prediction, that means that at its current market cap, crypto has been around 200 billion or so in market cap. Mm -hmm. This will have room for 40X growth for all wow. of crypto based on people who don't, don't even like crypto, yep. right? These are their predictions. Then the Royal Bank of Canada has the same prediction. They think crypto's market cap will eventually go to about nine trillion or so. I can so see we that. have 40x room for growth. So don't be whether you made money or, or lost money in the last few years, there's still room for growth if you're still around. You, you just have to stay in the game. And the best way to stay in the game is to keep educating yourself, keep doing research. That's why we built a platform to really do, help people do crypto research because. What was making money in 2017 is not making money now and in the future. And now we're competing with institutions. So we have to have tools like machine learning and everything to be able to, to compete with them. So with that being said, I, all I have to say is hang in there. And as, as I say on my channel, the moon is not the limit to the moon and beyond. Well, thank you so much for coming on the channel. I really liked everything you said. I'm enjoy I enjoy the idea of your platform, and I think that you're absolutely right. Uh, giving people the ability to keep researching even when it's it's not sexy, even when it's not profitable. That th these are the times where you really need to be layering in your your investments because those are the seeds that can truly explode. So I think it's very very wise words, Fud Nation. I hope you enjoyed this, and once again, thank you, Ian, for coming on the channel. Thank you.
Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I know I certainly did. A big thank you to Ian Bellina. If you guys are looking to check out the Token Metrics site, there is a link in the description below. In case anyone was wondering, there's no sponsorship here. The link in the description is not an affiliate link. I'm not, I don't make any money off this or anything like that. I do find that Ian has some very interesting perspectives and valuable information to share, and that's why I did this interview. Let me know, of course, what you thought of our conversation in the comments section below. And if you haven't done it already, smash that like button. It really helps support this video and this channel. As usual, I'm Elio Trades. You're watching FUD TV, and I'll see you very soon on the next episode.